I'm adding uh, Professor Divyakant Agarwal as the co-host so that I think he can speak. Good. Welcome, Dr. Agarwal. So shall I start, Anirban? Ah, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, this is the third day of the conference. And uh, on very first day, we had a very live workshops and uh, participation in various workshops were, was very, very high and very nice interactions we observed during the workshop. Uh, in terms of participants, perhaps not too many, sometimes in the conference session, but uh, quality of interactions were found to be very, very high. Even yesterday also, we observed the same thing. And today we have uh, one of the most uh, recognized researchers in the domains of artificial intelligence, worldwide web, and related areas. Uh, welcome, Professor Amit Sheth. It is our pleasure, and we find it great to have you here to deliver a keynote talk. Just for the introduction or information of uh, some young colleagues in the audience, uh, Dr. Sheth is a fellow of uh, Institution of Electronic and Electrical Engineering also is a fellow of Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, as well as American Society for Advancement of Science. These are one of those uh, you know, few recognitions he has uh, uh, received. Otherwise, he's a very, very significant uh, contributor um, in all domains, uh, research, academics, entrepreneurship, and uh, even societal activities. I know some of his societal activities. He's one of the highly cited researchers and he's among top 100 researchers in the domain of computer science. If you look at his uh, publication track record, is, is so strong. Uh, apart from research uh, and academics, uh, he has also, uh, he, he started three startup companies. And uh, when I used to interact, you know, I got a lot of information from him. Uh, and all these companies eventually they were uh, uh, what you can say transformed into successful um, you know commercial companies and so on. And all these startup companies were I mean this is the interesting that all all of, all of his startup companies were based on the licensing of his uh, university research. That means the kind of research he is doing is very relevant uh, uh, for the for the society and, and, and the industry. He has also co-founded the fourth one. I know most of his PhD students because I have interacted with them and all of them are doing wonderful. Mm -hmm. That also indicates his indirect contribution uh, in respective areas. And uh, Dr. Shet, you know, uh, I know you don't need much introduction. You are one of the most significant uh, contributors and it is a pleasure for us uh, to have you here and we are looking forward to your talk. And, uh, you know, uh, during talk or maybe uh, at the end of talk, uh, you know, uh, participants can ask you questions and I know you are always very, very interactive and thank you very much for joining, uh, accepting our invitation and uh, it is always a delight to uh, listen to you. Thank you. Hand over, I hand over and I request you to start. All right. Um, let me share screen. I don't know if you heard uh, uh, Sanjay, but um, uh, one of your PS, one of your students had come and uh, then uh, Pratik joined his PhD with me. Um, this year he won 10 year. Uh, so one of the papers that we had, uh, he was the first author with another of my PhD students. Uh, they got a 10 year award uh, from International Humanity Web Conference. Uh, just remembered. Um, all right. So uh, are you able to see? The presentation. Uh, well, I think I just did the presentation mode, so you should be able to see full screen. Huh. It's becoming visible now. All right. So, um, well, it's not come up on my screen yet, so I'll, I'm going to wait. The um, half screen was visible. The full screen. Yeah, now it says loading, so maybe it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it should take that long then. Ah, okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Now it, is now. Now it is. So um, I'm going to talk about um, a major shift that is happening in artificial intelligence. Generally, um, um, the first generation of AI in the last century uh, is characterized as symbolic AI. And uh, logic was, um, you know, logic played an important role. 
there used to be something called the fifth generation uh, initiative in Japan that was uh, expected to give a lot of um, you know uh, value. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't succeed as much. Um, then there came, then came AI winter and um, um, into the century in the first decade, uh, machine learning was very popular. So you basically uh, did, uh, you know, trained the algorithm by examples and then algorithm learned uh, particular things like classification, prediction and things of that nature. In 2012, so it's less than a decade earlier uh, from now, uh, prior to now, um, the deep learning or neural network uh, based uh, computation took place, uh, started rather. Uh, the general idea of neural networks uh, are quite old, but the computation algorithmic advances and others um, took root. So you did not have to manually do feature engineering, but they relied on very large amount of data. And many of these algorithms have shown that they can on a very targeted, narrowly defined task, they can do very well. They can beat humans on regularly on some, some of the tasks. And that has given um, a lot of uh, hype of what uh, AI in particular deep learning can do. Like any other technology, we started, some of us started to see that um, it has its own limitation. So this deep learning also, you can refer to them as statistical AI. From a large amount of data, a big corpus, you can learn patterns. Um, that has the limitations. And um, you can characterize this limitation by an analogy to uh, the human brain that uh, when you are when 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 humans are you know are say, you know have data coming at them um, it's not just the perception or something like uh, pattern finding that plays role simultaneously as you consume the data you are applying your knowledge your past experiences in understanding, interpreting the data and not just look for the patterns. So just correspondingly, we started to, some of us started to see the limitations of uh, the deep learning algorithms and uh, asked, wouldn't it be nice if we um, combine the knowledge uh, in this computational process, particularly deep learning uh, kind of algorithms. And if you can combine them, then we can make the things a lot more powerful. Mostly with examples from NLP, but there is no reason why it should be limited to NLP. I'm going to talk to you about this new uh, class of algorithms. Uh, we have used the term knowledge infused learning, but there are other related terms that others have also used. And um, I'm going to show you the possibilities of what happens when you can infuse knowledge with learning, deep learning algorithms, and, or when you combine them to try and get a hybrid AI a solution that combines statistical learning with symbolic learning kind of things. So, um, and in fact, uh, a crew of my students, PhD students who um, uh, are working this area, uh, and there's some more, so on the writing side, so these are all collection of people that in our ecosystem, my ecosystem, um, are working on this general area of uh, knowledge infused learning. Two of them who particularly helped me with this presentation are also on the call, Manas and uh, Kaushik. At the AI Institute, uh, this is, uh, what we are up to. In the center, I uh, identified some of the areas of artificial intelligence that we have been working on. 
and that includes reinforcement learning and uh, looking at uh, learning on multimodal data, knowledge graphs, of course, a variety of knowledge, uh, natural language processing, and many other things. And then outer uh, part of this uh, oval um, has um, a variety of application areas. So by now, um, AI Institute, which is only a year and a half old, less, less than a year and a half old, has uh, projects with uh, significant majority of the colleges in the University of South Carolina. And I, this is a research one university, very comprehensive research university, um, state flagship university. So there are a lot of good areas, um, all kinds of science and engineering and humanities areas are, <clears throat> are good at this university. And we, uh, uh, in that sense, we do a lot of translational research. We also, as in the past, I continue to work with uh, companies. Currently, I work with uh, maybe three or three or so, three or four. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, I talk about knowledge graph and deep learning, um, and uh, no, then introduce to you the knowledge infused learning, and then talk to you about some of the advantages um, of using. Uh, this particular strategy, especially in dealing with the uh, black box nature of the deep learning, uh, so that you can have interoperability and interpretability explainability. Um, given the short time, um, I, I, I'll be forced to cover, you know, I'll primarily give you the insights and examples rather than go deep, te uh, technically deep, uh, and go at the algorithmic level. Although uh, the tons of, a lot of papers available that can, and many other presentations in our YouTube channel uh, and our slide share for the AI Institute that you can uh, go to, uh, uh, to, to get into deeper, uh, go more deeper into the uh, technical details. <clears throat> One of the things that has happened in the last decade is this uh, sudden growth of knowledge graph. So if I have to identify one technology after deep learning that um, took the mind share of both researchers and enterprises, industry, is that of knowledge graphs. In fact, uh, in fact, my students have been in good demand because uh, they, in addition to knowing machine learning, they also know knowledge graphs and the industry is particularly very keen in exploring knowledge graphs. <clears throat> Many of you might uh, associate knowledge graph with uh, Google knowledge graph. So in 2013, Google came up with its new generation of search or semantic search, which extensively used knowledge graph. And it kind of showed that Google figured out that machine learning, which was the mainstay for Google search, wasn't sufficient for, uh, wasn't um, giving, uh, could be significantly improved by developing knowledge graph. This is something I had done in my second company, which actually had the very first pattern uh, in semantic web, which had the knowledge graph or ontology, uh, and, you know, and it's used in semantic search, browsing, advertisement, and personalization. But uh, because of uh, the internet bubble burst, uh, my company had to become a vertical uh, financial services company rather than a platform company that we started with. If we had remained flat of company, then we would have had, um, uh, uh, I did have product and customers of semantic search, but then we could not sustain it for, you know, in the way that Google was able to do later. Anyway, uh, in the related terms of ontology, uh, it's a kind of cuisine, uh, elder cousin of knowledge graph, knowledge base, a weaker form, uh, of lexicon or nomenclature uh, and such. Now, so yeah, this is that pattern that I had in year 2000. On the right hand side, you are seeing actually a knowledge graph or contain, you know, of variety of domains, just a top level. And it goes multi, several levels deep as in, you know, many knowledge persons do. And then uh, we use it for browsing, searching, profiling, personalizing, advertising. Dr. Shet, your slides are not visible, perhaps, at this moment. Oh. 
It says. Uh, I can see yeah. actually. Oh, yeah, I can I see at Bangalore. Okay. I can see at Bangalore. Uh, in Delhi. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. Okay, I now you <laughs> okay good. So um, since those times, uh, you know, in two thousand when we developed our semantic search engine, uh, that was early. But you can see that a lot more knowledge graphs have uh, come out. Uh, on the left hand side, you see some of the general purpose knowledge graphs. So they cover broad domain. Uh, DBpedia derived from Wikipedia cover a lot of domains, as you know. There've been uh, various uh, tech, uh, you know approaches like NEL, where they try to extract facts from the data on the web. On the right hand side, you are seeing some domain specific knowledge graph. In this case, I just took one domain, that of healthcare, and just listed some of the knowledge graphs. And several of these knowledge graphs are created by hand. Majority of the knowledge graph on the left, or, or some of the knowledge graph on the left are created automatically, some are automatically and some are manually. Some are on majority on the right are created manually. But now more are being created semi-automatically and automatically. For example, recently there was a paper two years ago where they expected uh, uh, knowledge from PubMed to create a rather large healthcare related knowledge graph. Uh, enterprises, and especially, uh, you know, enterprises like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, eBay, they have been quite busy developing the knowledge graph. And they have, some of them have employed literally thousands of people in creating their knowledge graph. I happen to give a keynote uh, in China, in, in, in Chengdu, um, in the Knowledge Graph Conference. So they have a conference just on Knowledge Graph. Uh, this was the second or third conference on Knowledge Graph there. Uh, they had about 600 participants and this was in person. So I could see all those 600 people. The person who introduced me was a member of Google's Knowledge Graph team. And he said they have about 10,000 people creating and maintaining Knowledge Graph. So there must be a very large economic reason why they invest so much money to create and maintain such knowledge graphs. At the same time, there are smaller companies that have developed um, tools to create knowledge graph on demand uh, on, uh, as consulting services and so on and so forth. These knowledge graphs tend to be relatively simple in a descriptional level. So they have people, organization, locations, those kind of products those kind of uh, large activities, uh, while the knowledge graph of science are very intricate and complex. But at the extensive level, they will not be that uh, big. Um, on the left, uh, in this case, is a, a knowledge graph that Manas, who is uh, um, my PhD student and is on the call, developed. That is for um, disaster. On the right hand side, is a knowledge graph that we developed for the uh, for, uh, third company that I founded uh, of the four. So this is the third that I co-founded uh, and uh, it is based in US and in Ahmedabad. And um, uh, last, uh, you know, they got a patent uh, for, you know, in, for using the knowledge graph to improve clinical language understanding. Um, and the concept of knowledge graph is now growing uh, to include a lot of other issues. For example, um, uh, there is, uh, in addition to domain specific knowledge graph that I've talked about, you may also have common sense knowledge graph. For example, uh, one of the well-known knowledge graph is ConceptNet. And uh, you may also have linguistic knowledge, for example, um, um, uh, uh, the uh, 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 the name is keeping my mind, but in a processing system, you might simultaneously use linguistic knowledge graph, common sense knowledge graph, and one or more domain-specific knowledge graph. Furthermore, 
we can talk about social norms or individual norms. For example, if you wanted to make a system that is culturally appropriate, less biased, it may be able to, you may be able to describe the constraints or, uh, uh, or, 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 or policies through this knowledge graph. Uh, for example, you may uh, talk about uh, um, a knowledge graph that capture the value systems or cultural aspects of, uh, or, you know, uh, of the related to users where you're going to deploy your AI system. So we call this humanity inspired AI uh, and I have the knowledge graphs, a variety of knowledge graphs to support that. With that brief introduction of knowledge graph, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of deep learning. Um, many of you may know this, but the deep learning, and typically there is a, a layered uh, neural network with multiple layers, C4 and such. And that, and you can see from lower level to going to the higher level of abstraction as you go up the uh, processing layers, right? Uh, this may be, let's say, conventionally, conventional neural network that may be doing this kind of processing. And it may be, for example, a face, a face identification system. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, uh, you, so you can have deep learning algorithms that physical search um, strategies. And AlphaGo is a very good example of that. Uh, something that is a very large search space. Uh, this system can be self-trained such that, but, but, and, and can be, can, it can beat humans most of the time, or almost always. On the right hand side, um, there's knowledge graph for protein uh, uh, design or protein folding, and it goes from uh, lower level features to an amino acid uh, to uh, the uh, structures of, you know, um, uh, you know, that, that describe protein folding. And um, in terms of the research, now there is an opportunity that we are investigating where can we incorporate it uh, into this deep learning architecture you're seeing certain constraints that um, uh, characterize desired features, uh, desired properties, uh, desired, you know, uh, for, uh, proteins that would be very stable, for example, or they may have particular um, uh, characteristics. Um, in, so as we see on one hand, very powerful deep learning systems, on the other hand, we see the opportunity to introduce um, uh, human reasoning, uh, strategies that humans have designed or, um, Things that humans have learned, for example, humans have learned toxicity of a drug molecule. And we may already have that, you know, experiment done and have that in a knowledge base. In that case, you would use that knowledge as part of deep learning to make it, um, to, to, to help it provide more useful results than just results. Uh, in this case, um, the simple, exa simple, relatively simple example of um, uh, arranging uh, the blocks in in order. Um, algorithms that simultaneously support reasoning uh, and planning with perception and uh, you know uh, low level uh, pattern recognition and make it powerful as our brain seems to be so our brain is constantly um, you know doing uh, equivalent of um, bottom of learning 
and statistically I kind of see for all the data that our brain receives. In the same time, is thinking, ah, uh, I need to get ready for this thing. I have this deliverable. Or that um, I'll pay attention to this thing coming to my brain and not this thing, right? So, um, and infusing the two, knowledge can play a very important role as I will try to explain. So, you know, um, uh, using this knowledge graph, you can provide explanation for uh, low level processing. And you could possibly, you know, uh, provide it uh, some strategies. You can pro use it to explain potentially what is happening in the uh, uh, in the algorithmic processing. Um, another thing you can do is in the you know in, in in this example of natural language processing, when you ask a question, who was the 44th president of the United States of America? Um, recently, uh, there was a uh, major, um, I guess, um, uh, system that uh, was unrolled uh, called GPT-3. Just before that, there's GPT-2 with, I think, 75 billion parameters. This one has 175 different billion parameters. Takes massive amount of computational uh, power and lots of data. So it had all of the Wikipedia and a lot of the other data corpuses that were given to it and from it learned, you know, a, a lot of, got a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of capability for natural language processing. So if you were to ask the question to GPC, it will be able to answer Barack Obama. But it will not be able to explain to you where it got this information from or um, uh, what is the trustworthiness of the information, what is the source of the information. You can visualize, you can help you visualize, like display the sentences where, from which it has, uh, uh, based on which it has given, a, uh, given you this answer. But if you had knowledge graph, which is on the left hand side, you can uh, characterize the answer and explain the answer, right? Where is, where is it coming from? You can say that this is uh, uh, data on v Wikipedia that is collectively edited, it's a collective intelligence, and hence there is an agreement about it. And we can, we can, we can call this data to be authoritative. And it says, clearly says that he served uh, as a 44 president of the United States and from this, this year to this year, right? So it gives you a lot more definitive information with knowledge graph as compared to using statistical AI alone. There are a lot of um, reasons why you could use knowledge graph. And today, obviously, I'm not going to be able to um, uh, go into many of these things. Uh, but I will um, give you a couple of examples about better contextualization of words and, um, uh, and, and something along that line. So um, let me take a very simple example. It's called retrofitting, and you know this is example of better contextual word. So if you are to use statistical AI, you get what you see on the left hand side: the vectors that are created and then uh, character, then put on a two dimensional space, will give you uh, the concepts of infrastructure affected, population damage. But you can see that beyond giving this uh, uh, topics it has very little meaning to a human. But when you apply some ontologies and knowledge graphs, like the ones that I have mentioned in the middle, and then it is possible to bring uh, the, this, then you can say that the uh, uh, infrastructure and damage are uh, related. For example, the empathy ontology would allow the, uh, Damage and infrastructure, damage to the infrastructure uh, is a concept in the empathy ontology, and hence you'll be able to bring them together. Or population is affected during a disaster. So again, you will be able to uh, you know uh, see them together compared to the way you see on the left hand side, 
and you will be able to even explain that look uh, there is an explicit relationship between population affected population in disaster in the disaster and ontology of empathy right so um, these kind of things are possible here um, you can see a series of evolution to make and natural language processing more meaningful and go towards natural language understanding. So there is a paragraph in news article you see on the top, CD is adding, adding, and when you use DBpedia, you'll be able to more appropriately and easily and confidently identify name entities like CDC, influenza, like in uh, themes and um, uh, uh, you know seasons, if you use certain NLP techniques like neural parsing with self-attention, you'll be able to identify other tokens that are interesting, like individuals present in influenza season. Now th this one, this was uh, common, so clearly this does some interesting things. But you can see there is the other interesting things that on the right hand side you see that are not here. There's some other things here that are not on the right hand side. Additionally, if you take more detailed knowledge for coming from Snowmed City, then you will be able to identify even more meaningful things. See, neither of us, uh, neither of these uh, uh, techniques identify tests for coronavirus. But with the Snowmed City, I would, I would be able to identify tests for coronavirus or uh, I would be able to um, identify influenza for one type or of one type. See here, you are identifying things that are less meaningful. This is likely to be much more meaningful. And collectively, but mostly through uh, SNOMED being playing very important role, you are able to identify a lot of related entities that can now improve your search because of we are talking about only one news article, but there are millions of news articles. And uh, now you can search for all the articles on that talk about tests for coronavirus. You could not be easily doing that. Uh, you could do that as a textual syntactic search, but then the, that can be uh, uh, talked about in many different ways, right? Coronavirus test, test for coronavirus, a particular test name, uh, which is a test for the coronavirus, all those would be missed out because the knowledge base would have, knowledge graph would say there's a test for coronavirus and it will have instances of it, examples of tests of coronavirus, right? So PCR test and some other tests, they will be all known to through the knowledge graph, which otherwise you can't do if you don't use knowledge. And uh, uh, in NLP, you have uh, this pipeline of knowledge extraction, knowledge alignment, knowledge cleaning, knowledge mining, knowledge based question answering. So here we are showing uh, some works. This, uh, these are the works from my team um, um, that uh, are in these areas. But there are there's tons of work by other other researchers in all of these areas. But in each of these cases. Here they have they use knowledge uh, and, and 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 improve upon what you can do with machine learning. Let me uh, share with you one very interesting example. Uh, one of the things we do is build uh, virtual assistants, and in particularly we uh, uh, do a lot of work in uh, building um, virtual health assistants. So we built a health, uh, you know, we built a mobile application or assistant for uh, asthma. Uh, we built an, a, 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 you know, a, a, a bot, uh, an assistant. Uh, we have built an application for COVID-19. We have built um, an assistant for mental health. We have built assistant for nutrition, right? Yeah, here's an example uh, where um, you can ask your Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant, hey, Google, or hey, you know, Alexa, how is the weather today? And you'll get the answer. Right, and what is the weather today? So many degrees, uh, this is Fahrenheit, of course. Can I play outside? Yeah, sure, enjoy the day. But if the system has the context and is personalized for the patient with asthma, 
uh, and so as I said, we will be one of the asthma chatbots or, or assistants. Then it would have a personalized health knowledge graph that will tell about that patient's condition. It will know that um, in asthma, there can be allergies that play a role. So that is context and that a particular, yeah, this particular patient has red wheat pollen allergy. So when the patient asks, uh, what's the weather today? It can say uh, the weather, but then say, can I play outside? Well, it will say, the doctor has specified, told you that you, you know, you are allergic uh, to the pollen. And uh, through the web service, I know that today pollen is high. So uh, you may likely experience symptoms and hence take your uh, rescue medication with you and enjoy the day, right? So, uh, you know, and imagine um, with the pollution in India um, and a uh, lot of asthma, uh, the system can maybe uh, guide you to say today, uh, you should wear uh, uh, the mask. I mean, let us even post COVID days. And uh, today you should, in addition to wearing mask, uh, you should, um, take your uh, you know, inhaler with you. And that can prevent a lot of misery, that can prevent, that can, that can really help improve the health. The same kind of things we try to do for uh, patients, uh, children with type one diabetes, um, or adult and elderly patients with uh, hypertension. So in addition to general knowledge, it's highly customized, but in this kind of system, uh, you can't, you won't have enough data, so you can't have deep learning system do this for you. You really have to have knowledge. Uh, you would be able to take um, uh, the patient discharge summary. Then you go to doctor and doctor gives you do this, do not do this, they take this medication. There's only one instance of that. There's not like millions of instances for deep learning to learn from. So you need to convert that into a knowledge graph. Um, and constraints and, and, and modify your learning algorithm. This is an example where knowledge graph plays a very important role for uh, connecting multimodal data. So on the right side in the bottom, you see the data uh, from road sensor network. And when there is an overturned uh, truck, uh, the traffic is very slow. The, it is the time it takes to pass a particular road link. So you can see the spike there. And uh, on the top, in the below that uh, overturned truck, uh, you think this one says, what is the normal traffic for this day of the week? In a, you know, and then uh, because uh, this one shows an anomaly, you are looking for reason. Why, why, why is traffic slow? And it so happens that Somebody has, on Twitter has posted that there is an overturned traffic at, or truck at this location. So I know spatial proximity because I know special things from the uh, road network and I know special things from um, the location of the, you know, uh, the associated with Twitter, uh, with the tweet. And I am able to convert that location through the use of noise graph into something that I can map with the coordinates. And I can even, uh, you know, patient, uh, the, the, let's say that uh, the person doing Twitter does not have uh, his geo coordinates uh, turned on. But he says, Golden Highway, uh, you know, accident on the Golden Highway at the Viking um, in Devland uh, uh, and something like that. So, so this is the location. And from there, I can convert that into, um, uh, you know, uh, spatial coordinates. Right. So how can you do that without the knowledge graph that can help you make this conversation, conversation right? So in the context of um, uh, this uh, nutrition thing, we use knowledge graph to understand a person's uh, food history, nutrition knowledge, and many other things to help you choose the food that you can eat or should eat or not eat. And um, uh, we use also knowledge graph to improve the deep learning algorithms to identify the food images that we, uh, that, a, that, that a person takes on his smartphone. Here's an example in which um, um, 
um, the knowledge graph, uh, sorry, the deep learning algorithm comes up with uh, this cluster you see on the left hand side. But what are those? What are those uh, clusters about? What what do they um, talk about? Well, without understanding what those clusters about, you know, like tag, you can see the tags of morphine or hydrophone uh, or uh, uh, methadone. How did you how do you come up with that? It's, so by using the knowledge graph, you can see on the right hand side we use op opioid drug knowledge graph and uh, or it, this is Kamdas work probably uh, and that uh, we know what those dots mean and from that we can say what is the uh, high level concept which is in this case morphine so, so this question is about morphine now this becomes meaningful otherwise the dots that are new uh, that close to each other doesn't give you much you know information to act upon so the idea is to uh, combine glue symbolic knowledge with the statistical knowledge and, um, um, and, and, and that is the knowledge infused learning. In the process, um, we uh, build the systems that are explainable uh, and, um, and has many other uh, properties. So there are some of the challenges of deep learning listed on the left hand side and knowledge graph, uh, you know, why it is good is on the right hand side. I'm going to give you examples to, uh, for this. So one of our projects was about, and it has been about um, understanding radicalization on social media. You, got, you may be aware that um, a jihadis had recruited uh, distant, uh, you know, uh, lonely um, uh, Western teenagers and and and, and, twin, uh, and people in their twenties uh, to join Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS in Middle East, and uh, they followed very sophisticated process to recruit these uh, these these people, youngsters. And uh, we had some ground truth data, but we wanted to understand uh, how is this process work. Uh, how does this process work? Uh, it's a long story, but um, if you feed all this data, um, even if there is a massive amount of data on Twitter, the amount of data just related to radicalization and extremism is pretty small comparatively. It's there, but not that massive. So right there, there is one issue that deep learning always itself will face. But more importantly, there are nuances about the radicalization that is very important to understand and that you can understand by empirical studies. It so happens that one of our collaborators was a political scientist who um, had studied the radicalization problem and come up with an empirical model that says that radicalization has three components, religion, ideology and violence. And then he says, okay, for the religion, look, uh, there are these um, religious texts, uh, the Hadith and uh, Quran, in the case of Islamic, uh, Islamic extremism. And um, the jihadis, extremists use the word jihad in a way that is not the normal way as is defined in the Quran. Quran uh, in the Quran, jihad is described in a positive way for self-improvement, self-control. Jihadists use it for totally different purpose. And um, so you can see here on the bottom right, it's uh, jihad, um, a cluster of jihad in the uh, religious, uh, extremist context and non-extremist context. You can see. Now, if I don't know that there are these two um, different uses of jihad, and if I don't incorporate that knowledge that there are these two um, uh, interpretation of jihad into my learning 
process, I'm going to have one jihad. There's a token jihad and I'm, I'm not going to make distinction between the two. And then I just won't be able to understand what's happening, right? So it's a very powerful um, uh, you know, example that shows you why for many problems, uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, by itself is not sufficient. That knowledge is critical. In this case, um, um, there is, a, you know, um, you can see the text and that um, there are three examples. The first example is an example of use of jihad for ideological purpose. Second is the example, which is for religion and ideological person, uh, purpose. And the third is for hate and violence or violence. And given that we have knowledge graph, com, you know, covering religion, ideology, hate and violence, we are able to understand what is happening here, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental games are being played by the jihadi to, to, to kind of uh, you know, brainwash the children and things of that nature. Okay. And now, um, the, uh, how, how, so we talked about, you know, the advantages, benefits, reasons, why, and a little bit about what. Now, the question of how, how do you infuse knowledge with deep learning algorithms? So we, we have come up with this classification, shallow infusion my deep infusion and deep infusion. And um, while I won't have a lot of time to discuss this in detail, I will give you just high level um, insight. So here is the classification, a bunch of work is done. Uh, I won't discuss that. Um, there are different, um, in, in a shallow classification, you can incorporate knowledge through bag of words or phrases of corpus. Uh, phrases from semantic lexicon, counts of nouns, pronouns, verbs. So you can see sentiments and emotions of a sentence. Number of different ways uh, uh, you can take uh, knowledge, and this is relatively uh, knowledge is organized in a very uh, limited way, shallow way. Right? Bag of words is not very rich structure. And then you can uh, primarily through embedding process, you can combine. Uh, them. Here is a very interesting example, uh, and uh, there is more and more working coming. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, Manas has a paper in Amia, um, uh, where uh, you can see on the left hand side uh, analysis of electronic medical records, and you can see the clusters here: depressive, appealing, and drug abuse, gun ownership, suicide attempts, and self harm. Now the question comes. Well, when patients and uh, talk to doctors, they don't tell everything. So the question is what people hide from clinicians and can we learn from uh, other source of information where people are more free to discuss what uh, they don't discuss with uh, clinicians and that is social media. So on the right hand side is the analysis that um, uh, Manas and team did on uh, Reddit and you can see a different cluster showed up. And the idea here is to use um, the thing on the right hand side to enhance the understanding on the left hand side for clinical decision making. Right? So that makes for a powerful tool. Recently, we submitted a proposal uh, related to uh, women, uh, women's, um, uh, uh, why women are getting different outcome or less good outcome compared to men. Uh, for cardiovascular disease. Uh, so uh, working with um, University of California, San Francisco, we have defined that project. More work has to be done though. This is an example where um, one of the most important things in autonomous vehicle, which is very rich with sensor data. You have radar and LIDAR and all kinds of stuff. And here we showed that uh, a thin knowledge graph helps you address a very important problem of field similarity. That I 
with the i have a picture in a way uh, quote unquote picture of my road for my car is it similar to other thing that i have learned in the past and was there some thing i learned for example um if i see a whole bunch of um a yellow uh, you know buses which is school which are school buses i need to change my behavior or the car is to be going much more slowly 25 miles per hour is the limit then right so that kind of thing where it's not just here and now my sensors have found an object and i need to avoid the object or slow down that's something they do now but the future autonomous vehicle will be more intelligent and for getting that intelligence you need this noise graph then there is this idea of semi digital deep algorithm so in this case um uh, a team has taken manas and uh, uh, others kaushik and others have taken this um, data from reddit and on the left hand side these are different reddit uh, subreddits then there are different terms and uh there is a um, uh, medical uh, document called dsm5 which is a training manual for people for clinical uh, people who are training, getting trained for mental health so with that there are um, you know they have to um, understand uh, dpr which is depression or um, sbi uh, which is related to um uh, uh, um manas what is sbi Uh, OCD, uh, we have all heard of OCD. Uh, then there is a um, uh, suicidal uh, behavior. So uh, there is addiction, SAD. So there are these kind of um, uh, concepts that are defined, which we can learn uh, from DSM-5 and understand how to associate these words to those concepts. so it says that this particular uh, sentence is this set of couple of sentences expresses all of these concepts understanding this concept now takes this text into clinical domain which now you can use to make clinical uh, decision making there is another example where um, different knowledge graphs allow us to understand different types of clinical information treatment information observation and drug related information mental health condition information all kind of stuff right so it allows deeper understanding and converts this set into something that is uh, interesting in clinical terms here i'm going to uh, you know just give you a very quick view this is a matrix that was developed on the left hand side you have mental health related reddit and on the Uh, bottom you have dsm5 category so uh, the 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 uh, the terms here the di cd tnd sad these are dsm5 related categories and so those are the ones that are um, on the x axis right and then you develop this matrix and then in the deep learning algorithm along with what happens with the you know on the left hand side is the you know cna dimension embedding based on words which is what would be done by a uh, uh, main say um, deep learning algorithm that has been enhanced by using that uh, you know uh, the embedding that is uh, been developed based on the domain knowledge from dsm5 based on the 20 dsm5 categories right and you create that and when you combine these two things then uh, you are able to um, take the and a text and understand whether the text relates to depression or disorder or substance use and addiction disorder the interesting thing here is that there's a guy uh, this is uh, who has written this text more in two different places two different reddits one in depression one in uh, bipolar and in bipolar he says honestly i'm not having bipolar disorder and through this processing we can understand that um uh, the text really uh, uh, the person is really uh, talking about depression and not bipolar disorder and it is through the use of this knowledge that we are able to do that 
And here we show uh, in this paper um, that um, when you incorporate more knowledge, we can improve. So on the left-hand side, uh, uh, lexical and syntactic features were used. Then uh, some more uh, TF-IDF features were used. Then contextual features were used. Then uh, some DSM-5 knowledge hierarchy was added. Then drug abuse ontology and DSM-5 knowledge hierarchy were uh, added. And then uh, slang terms uh, were also added. And increasingly, that um, gave you less and less error, less and less uh, false alarm, and improved the results. So it shows that we can feed more knowledge and uh, get uh, the results. Looks like my time is running out, so I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, uh, some some more things, uh, but I want to just make one last point that these things help you make um, uh, interpretable and explainable systems. So um, in this particular case, if you just apply uh, deep learning uh, uh, and you try to predict what is this text about, it could predict depression, but it is false. The true answer is depressive compulsive disorder. And uh, what happens is that uh, you can get these better results by incorporating this uh, matrix that I had shown you earlier. But more than that, uh, uh, and it says why I can come up with the right answer because I am able to use this DSM-5 uh, based uh, uh, you know, knowledge. Uh, but then you can uh, further um, associate that with the uh, concepts in the knowledge graph, which you see on the left hand side. And from, because those are the concepts that are instantiated in the text on the right hand side, you are able to then say, ah, this is uh, uh, because of all of these things that this is obsessive compress, uh, compulsive personality disorder. And, uh, um, and that because of uh, this kind of thing, we can now explain. I am not uh, going to skip that and I'm going to end um, uh, with the last uh, slide. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, there are some more examples in education. I, we are working with um, a company in India, uh, a, a reliance uh, a fund, geo funded company, which is developing fantastic education technology. And in conclusion, well, uh, these are some of the nervous infusion uh, learning related research areas that uh, are very interesting. And uh, these are some of the um, areas of application that we are involved in uh, using this knowledge infused learning and, uh, you know, comparison with the traditional methods. And I end here. No, thank you very much, Dr. Shet. And uh, there are a few questions. Uh, please address them. And now I request Dr. Anirban to take over as I have to leave for some UGC visit. But thank you very much. I will be in touch with you. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. For the excellent uh, and very insightful presentation. Now, let us open the floor for questions. Can I? Ha, sure, please ask. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, first of all, it was a wonderful presentation, Professor. I have a question. The question is that graph neural network, graph neural network is how do you see that its potential and uh, you know, uh, compared to what you are doing and its opportunities and power and flexibility, whatever it is. I mean, primarily, I would like to hear something from you on GNN. I think uh, um, you're going to find more and more uh, adoption of graph neural networks. Uh, so uh, on one hand, we are um, uh, figuring out uh, the scaling problem filling issue with graph neural networks. And um, I have always been, um, uh, I, 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 I have always uh, given due attention to expressiveness uh, as opposed to just scalability and performance. So uh, as we go from a vector to matrix to graph, clearly, and within the graph, eventually uh, label graph and directional and la directional label graph, you have richer representation of knowledge uh, or, or richer representation, whether of knowledge or not, of data or knowledge. 
So um, even for data uh, base, even for uh, processing or deep learning, graph neural network will in in many in some cases uh, be the right mechanism, and it will find favor as we go along. For somebody like us who are also very interested in exploiting the power of knowledge, uh, the favorite mechanism for uh, knowledge, representing knowledge is gra graph. That's why you call it knowledge graph. And hence the alignment of a knowledge graph with uh, graph neural network will be more um, possible. Uh, those are the things that we are looking at in our deep infusion method. So it is a very attractive method uh, for us to explore, for many uh, for others to explore. And uh, you're going to see uh, more and more um, work, uh, uh, um, you know, there was um, uh, uh, somebody from um, IIA, uh, in IISP, um, Talukdar, uh, Parthar Talukdar, um, they, they gave a nice tutorial on graph neural networks. And um, uh, I'm going to see, we're going to see more and more of those. 